Hello folks, I'm presenting today from Bozeman, Montana. It's about 25 degrees out and partly cloudy. We're uh, actually feeling a, a warm streak right now. It was about negative 30 a week and a half ago, so uh, we're happy to be thawing out. <clears throat> please let me know if, uh, if you can hear me okay or if you need me to speak up louder. Um, please add a text in the comment window if you need me to be louder. I currently serve as a technology integration and curriculum specialist here in the Bozeman School District in Montana. Um, this is southwest Montana. This is our hamlet. Um, I would point out though that these pictures are a bit um, uh, false. You know, you don't want to plan a visit here anytime soon. Uh, it's not as pretty as it looks. Just joking. <clears throat> Prior to my um, current role uh, working in uh, professional development settings, I instructed middle school and high school science and uh, math in a public school. The school I worked in was a BYOD and we facilitated hybrid and blended learning environments through the use of Blackboard's different LMS options. I found great advantage instructing with these tools in a hybrid classroom environment not only for the student benefit but also for reflective purposes. I was able to immediately observe student performance and receive feedback regarding my online instruction practices with this blended audience. And that benefit is not easily observable um, for purely online instructors. But because of that benefit, many of the activities that I will share today are tested and approved. Um, however, like all teaching endeavors, there were plenty of other activities that just didn't make the cut. So um, if you're just starting out with some of these online tools, I recommend using kind of an action research approach, which suggests um, frequent solicitation of student feedback regarding what works and what doesn't work, and thoughtful reflection of ongoing tinkering that will lead you to you know, success with these tools. <clears throat> All right, so one of the objectives today is just to share some practical strategies for engaging students within discussion boards, blogs, and wikis right from the start. Uh, you know, if, if used properly, these tools have a very positive impact on student achievement, engagement, motivation, communication, uh, technology and information literacy. In addition, they provide added opportunity for collaboration and differentiation. And I'll point out some of those examples today. While using these tools in a blended environment, I really appreciated the immediate benefit of student accountability and formative feedback. Every student had the opportunity to answer in real time, not just a few students that I called on voluntarily or involuntarily. Plus, students had opportunity to think and respond at a comfortable pace. So it wasn't just the first three hands that went up in the classroom, uh, again, leading to added accountability with all students. I wanted to take a, um, a moment to share, I guess, an, a cautionary tale, though. <clears throat> oh, actually, let me um, do a quick poll first. So Lauren, if you would help facilitate this. I've got three poll questions uh, that will follow through. Great. So yes, you can just use that same polling feature I talked about a second ago to answer A, B, C, or D about the instructional setting that you teach in. A for online, B for blended, C for hybrid, or D for other. And if you do select D, feel free to write your response in the chat and we will publish each of these poll results um, to the whiteboard. So we'll give everyone about 10 more seconds. And Miles, a quick question. Do you want to explain the difference between your choices B and C, blended and hybrid? You know, if I were to um, if I were to follow um, who is it? Clayton, I believe, um, author of uh, the book is uh, slipping my um, consciousness right now. Uh, he he does a lot about like identifying and labeling. The um, I'm sorry, Clayton uh, Christensen labeling different types of online environments and hybrid and blended environments. A blended environment being one where students uh, would work in a brick and mortar school at, at least part of the time and complete online instruction either in the school building itself or at their own place at their own pace outside of school. Uh, the hybrid meaning more of a, a classroom that is facilitating online tools in a face-to-face -face environment and the instructor is delivering the pacing. So all students are 
relatively at the same point of in the instruction, and uh, all students are completing, like let's say, a discussion task at the same time within uh, the teacher's classroom. Does that uh, clarify it? I think so, but let us know um, if you have follow-up questions about that, Sarah. Okay, great. And uh, we just published the poll results for everyone. Let's move on to the next one here. So again, this is for please select the instructional setting that you teach in. So we just cleared the responses. So A for graduate, B for undergraduate, C for K-12, or D for a work setting. And we'll give everyone about another 5-10 seconds. And Deb, if you teach in both, then great, just write it in the chat. Or pick your favorite for the poll. There's that one published. It looks like most are in the undergraduate setting right now. Great. And last poll question. Please rank your background designing instructions facilitated through a learning management system. In about another five seconds. And there are those responses. So it looks like this group is between the novice and advanced stage. Great, thank you. <clears throat> well, let's go ahead and proceed here. I want to, um, I guess, point out a, a cautionary tale with using some of these tools. Um, one, I really like to separate new tools from academic learning in the classroom. Um, I usually use an uh, icebreaker with a new discussion board tool or a new blog tool or a new wiki tool before I start combining uh, with academic content. I believe students should be proficient with the tool before the academics so that we don't stress them out um, and cause them distress with the learning at hand. <clears throat> Another intentional application, I would highly suggest that we avoid using a digital tool as a status quo. Uh, I'm speaking from experience with a lot of graduate and undergraduate courses where I've had instructors just use a discussion board because that's what a previous instructor might have used. And that being said, you know, I started using discussion boards in, um, as a student in an undergraduate setting 15 years ago. And back then it was in its infancy. A lot of times instructors might ask a pretty concrete series of questions that would be answered by the first few students who participated and the rest of us would be left wondering what else could we contribute. Um, so when I'm using these types of different tools, I always want to consider what my student objectives should be, and furthermore, what my teacher objectives should be, or the instructor objectives. So I'm always asking, you know, what are the advantages of using blank activity with my students? What goals do I have for my students, and how does a particular activity or tool support these goals? And if the particular technolo technological tool doesn't support these goals or, or enhance, um, I would caution you not to use it. We don't want to overuse tools just for the sake of that's what our uh, previous instructors have done. So some common instructor objectives with you know, online communication tools. I want my students to read and apply content. I want my students to compare and contrast. Or I want my students to share an opinion and compare perspectives of other students. I want them to analyze content and create personal connections or reflections. I want them to analyze and evaluate a variety of global perspectives. Or I want students to take a stance on a controversial topic and argue using evidence. So these are, I guess, some common objectives that I have as an instructor when I decide to use these tools. It's not limited to this list of objectives, but this is what I found these types of activities or these types of objectives work well with online communication tools. In today's presentation format, I'm going to um, provide a, a series of different types of activities that 
support a tool well. And then I'll pause for questions before I move on. So we'll start with a discussion board, move on to some examples of blogs, and finally with wikis. And we'll pause for questions between each. And many of the examples that I share specific to discussion boards might also work well in a blog. Uh, and that's part of the instructor's objective to decide which tool works for uh, the, the task at hand. And um, in the discussion boards, I'm going to go over a couple different, I guess, categories of questions. Along with the discussion board and also the blog and the wiki tool, I'm going to introduce different types of activities that start from more basic applications to more complex. As an instructor, I want to make sure that I mentioned earlier that I, I use a simple icebreaker just to make sure that the students know the functionality, uh, let's say the discussion board, they know how to make a post and read each other's and so forth. But then as I start to add the academic content, I want to scale it so that students are comfortable, the tasks at first are a little more concrete, and then I move into more and more complex tasks through the semester or throughout the school year. So each of these tasks helps to build basic skills to more complex skills. And you know, I would um, make some connections. We've done a lot of athletic coaching and observed a lot of outstanding athletic coaches. And if you think of the analogy of coaching, we start with a basic skill and then we build upon it. We don't just throw a student into a competition that's a complex series of events and interactions. Uh, and so we start with some of these practice tasks and we move into more complex, which I'll show you next here. My first type of task for students is to create a test question. And in this particular activity, <clears throat> I'm asking students to um, demonstrate digital skills in a more autonomous nature. My teacher objective for this activity includes having students demonstrate autonomous proficiency with the discussion board functions, as well as to have students review and apply content from the text, or in this particular example, if you look into my directions, <clears throat> I've got a, uh, a linked article named Warming of Arctic May Affect Worldwide Climate. So students would just click on that link and uh, a PDF document would open up, or maybe I'd link to a website and so forth. So they're going to go into that article and, and um, review content and then make applications. Students are going to make applications by responding to my prompt and creating four test style questions, one from each page of the article that they read through. At minimum, they needed to create a short answer and one essay style question. And they can also choose by creating a multiple choice, a matching, or a fill in the blank, etc. I've got a uh, a police siren going by outside. I'm going to pause for a minute just so that's not a distraction. All right. <clears throat> so this is a rather concrete task still. Again, I'm trying to build autonomous skills with my students. They're going to go into an article, pull out text-dependent questions, create their own questions for other students. And then on day two, students will come back. They will review each other's uh, questions, and they will reply to each other. Um, the neat thing is that I've also used an example that I use frequently, whether it's a discussion board or a blog. Just in the lower half of the screen, you'll see the name of this first response is student example. What I've done here is I've actually gone back into my LMS and I've created a fictitious student who I named student example. As a teacher, I created the prompt and then I immediately log out and log back in as the student example and I create a typical response. So it's the first thing that students will see. It gives them a, I guess, a bullseye to shoot for. I demonstrate my aesthetic representation, how I want the questions laid out, as well as typical answers and so forth, the typical formatting that I'm expecting for my students. So that's a, a, a nice little tip to put along. It's always good to log in as a student and see what they perceive. Um, sometimes the screens may look a little different than the instructor's role within the LMS. Uh, so it's always good to double check that too. All right, I'm going to move on to uh, the next activity.
So that first one I showed there where the students are creating test-like questions in the discussion board, rather concrete. I'm not going to get a lot of engaging, high-level, complex discussion. But again, I'm building skills and I'm ratcheting up into more complex, open-ended scenarios. In this particular scenario, this is a, a photo taken from a National Geographic article. <clears throat> and um, I'm releasing students into more open-ended questions in, in a bit of a calculated way. There's no right or wrong answer to this question. However, some students may look more closely and think more deeply about the perceived meanings from this allegory. Students will not be expected to answer using evidence just yet, but they will be asked to review other classmates, classmates' posts and identify students who posted different perspectives than their own on day two. So this is a small step in I guess a metacognitive training that I'm using to prepare my students for more complex tasks um, that I'll soon require where they are going to soon be an analyzing other student perspectives and engaging in discourse using evidence and argumentation. So moving on to a more complex task, and this one's about a controversial topic. I highly in, um, recommend integrating contemporary controversial topics into the discussion board. I witnessed uh, a lot of student appreciation for these types of tasks, both in feedback that I solicited, as well as uh, the quality of student work and student engagement, especially from students who are, are shy or students who are challenging to motivate in a blended or hybrid classroom. And I would assume the same would be true in an online environment for those um, particular student styles. So because of some of these uh, revelations of how this matches with certain student learning types, I think we can definitely identify this as a, a potential differentiation tool for teachers. So let's break down how I approach this particular activity. On the first day, I provide students with a digital worksheet that contains text-dependent questions linked to a grade-level appropriate website. I'm going to move ahead on one slide here. So here's an example of my worksheet. This was specific to a ninth grade physical science classroom. And this follows a unit on atomic theory. <clears throat> and so I'm moving students into a theory that's not accepted by the scientific uh, community. But it's a popular theory out there. And in fact, it's made press within magazines like Discover or Scientific American or Time and so forth. So it's a contemporary controversial topic. <clears throat> and uh, my teacher objectives include having students become literate on an abstract topic in science, to take a stance on this controversial abstract theory, to learn why a new theory might be needed in the scientific community, to observe and evaluate how scientific community is critical in and of itself, and to exhibit these critical tendencies by evaluating and arguing with each other through online discourse based on evidence or citations of experts in the field. And that's quite a bit for a ninth grade student. The text dependent questions viewed here are linked to a variety of oppositional viewpoints. So those blue questions are hyperlinked to specific web pages. And I've, kept, uh, I've included a couple of thumbnail web pages on the right, one from Time that gives a general overview of string theory. One from NOVA uh, that is a critical opponent of string theory. And then the one in the bottom right is a great website specific for um, you know, adolescent high school students' uh, vocabulary about string theory. And it's uh, it got a good explanation of everything that's involved with it. So students are getting a, a nice view of both sides of the story. <clears throat> this is important. It's important to assist students in becoming literate on both sides before having them take a stance. If I skip this initial activity, then my discussion board will likely fall flat. Students will be speaking uh, in an opinionated manner and not arguing from evidence or citing experts in the field and so forth. So after they complete this activity and these text-dependent questions, students will be asked to answer three of the five prompts that I provide them. In the top left corner, I provided a prompt uh, that was just a screenshot from my discussion board. And then I just simply typed in the other four prompts below. 
<clears throat> these are open-ended questions. There's no right or wrong. I'm really trying to engage students in um, putting themselves out there. Some other specifics that I had involved with this is that the students needed to base their response um, and include, it, include a citation in it from either the articles that I provided or they could freely move on into the World Wide Web and um, collect evidence on, from their own searches. So they weren't just limited to the articles I provided. <clears throat> So on the third day, after students respond to three of those five questions, then I ask students that they need to go back into the discussion board and they need to read through their peers, they need to evaluate, and they need to create two more prompts. One, they are to find somebody they agree with and create a reply. And two, they are to find somebody they disagree with and create a reply. And in each reply, they need to um, also back their, their reply with either evidence or a citation from an expert from their web search or from the articles they provided. So here's an example of a ninth grader. Uh, this is a rebuttal and it says, Catherine said, quote, and it's quoting another student. And then a little bit further down it says in the second paragraph, I agree with this statement about technology and so forth. And then third paragraph, according to Stephanie Burns, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but just to demonstrate the level of uh, discourse that's occurring, I'm going to move on. You'll see very similar level of discourse occurring from a lot of other student uh, responses here. I um, don't include these necessarily for you to read all the way through them, but you can tell that the students are um, being pretty polite with each other. They're exhibiting proper net etiquette, which I would have already coached them on. Um, they're using citations uh, mostly in a proper manner. For ninth graders, this is excellent. If I try to have ninth graders use citations in other uh, facets of my classroom, I hear a lot of grumbling and complaining. And with an activity like this, because their students are arguing, there was no uh, complaint about the citation process. <clears throat> um, so I guess it's you know natural for adolescents to want to argue, and they exhibit motivation and engagement um, with activities like this. One more quick screenshot of some different types of agreements or disagreements between students. Another neat facet or novelty with this is that students that are shy or students that are tough to motivate in the classroom excel at projects like this. Um, I've always blown away by the level of detail and the depth of thought and depth of knowledge from students that uh, I wouldn't tease out in other ways in other activities. So it's uh, again leading to another um, opportunity for differentiation in activities within the classroom. <clears throat> I've got one other quick uh, one to demonstrate about a controversial topic. This is a slightly different strategy. This particular question was taken from an AP biology book and used in a ninth grade, tenth grade biology classroom. So I'll let you just read through the prompt. It's kind of important to read this prompt to get a sense of the question I'm asking the students. So again, this is a contemporary issue, and um, it's a real issue, uh, and it's appropriate right after my unit on cells and stem cell uh, controversies and so forth. You know, as um, one of my teacher goals here is to um, have students analyze and evaluate each other's perspectives in order to better appreciate the complex emotional, social, and political undertones associated with biological research. And so I can do that in my classroom um, by one, having them reply to that particular post. And then on the second day, I give them a worksheet that looks like this. The directions are that they are to read through their peers' responses, and they have to evaluate and choose one student who they felt provided the best argument for John Moore, or they agreed with John Moore's case, and one argument for, um, that was against John Moore, or disagreed. And so they go through, and they're not allowed to choose their own, of course, but they go through and read through everyone else's perspectives. Now, I didn't require that they read through everyone else's, but they did that naturally because they didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Um, next, 
they would summarize key points after they selected one student who agreed, the student who gave the best argument for, they'd summarize key points of other students' writing. Uh, they'd fill in those two boxes you see in the middle or those graphic organizers. And then below, the, the real task then was they had to choose based on, only on the facts that they summarized above. Uh, who should win this court case? So now we're getting into um, evaluation and making judgments and um, analyzing other students' perspectives and so forth. And again, my goal is I wanted the students to perceive just how complex some of these different emotional, social, and political undertones are. And they can do that within the classroom quite easily with a task like this. Again, I had students that I wouldn't um, usually see them raising their hand in, in the blended classroom very often that were just absolutely doing a phenomenal job in tasks like this. Shy students stood out. And in fact, it was neat to see which classmates um, were selected most frequently. And oftentimes it was a student that wouldn't verbalize themselves often in the blended classroom, but um, could have been an incredible writer. And so when they write, and they know they're writing to an open audience, and they know the teacher is going to use their writing to be evaluated by others, it's amazing the, the level of accountability and the level of detail and thought that students will put into it naturally. All right, this is our last uh, discussion example. Um, this one sounds like it's uh, quite routine at first, but there's a twist to it in the second part. So this particular rubric aligned with a current event that I would use on a weekly basis. In the first few weeks as the instructor, each week I would select a current event that I pulled off of a news site. Um, and this particular class was an environmental science class. So I pick an, a relatively appropriate environmental news article about the topics we were studying at the time in the class. Students had to log in twice and complete three discussion posts within a week. That sounds pretty familiar to a lot of uh, you know, undergraduate uses of discussion boards. However, the twist comes in on the next step. In, week, um, in, in about the fourth or fifth week, I turn it over to individual students in the class. Um, individual students become the weekly group facilitator. Individual students have to go out in advance and find a topic related to the um, content during that week and then post the article and text dependent questions for the rest of the class to uh, deliberate and uh, discuss about. The, the group facilitator has to log in just as many times as the students, but the group facilitator asks more questions throughout the week and helps steer um, the, the discourse or, or whatnot to, to keep things moving with, between all students. And then finally, the facilitator takes time at the end of the week to summarize um, the different discussions that were held. So they create a, a two or three paragraph response uh, and post that as a summary for the week. I can't take all, all the credit for this one. This uh, was used oftentimes uh, by one of my um, excellent graduate professors, Dr. Walt Wolbaugh at Montana State University. And uh, so I lived in this environment as a student for uh, several courses. And it was a very engaging uh, online discussion forum. Uh, it was really neat to have that responsibility to be the facilitator, um, to go in and generate questions, to read ahead, uh, to be the expert for the week. And so uh, each week, when I did this in my K-12 environmental science class, you know, I would, I would um, have every student in the class become a facilitator at least once during the school year or during the semester, at, um, depending on the class size and so forth. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to pause for some questions here. Um, any questions about discussion boards or some of those activities? And then we'll move on to a few more activities on blogs and wikis. Great. And so everyone, you can just write your questions or comments in the chat. And I will say, Miles, there has been some chat about the quote button that you showed on the earlier allegory slide. Um, and I think we, you know, that is a feature that is specific to course sites. Um, but I do know they're talking about, you know, the preference for using quote versus reply. Do you want to just touch on that and why you choose to use the quote button in your classroom? Sure. Um, you know, the quote button just uh, captures the, um, the original author's posting and then puts it down below, kind of like when you reply in an email and you'll see the original author's posting below. I like the quote button just because it makes it easier for participants who are reading the different threads to uh, 
just connect it with what was uh, composed previous uh, so that they don't have to click around in the, in the different chain of threads to try to, um, to, try to locate the relevance or, or the argument at hand and so forth. And some of those uh, examples are two and three years old. I dug back into some different courses and so forth. Um, and so some of those buttons may aesthetically look a little different or the features within course sites or Blackboard Learn or whatever LMS you might be using uh, may lay it out in a manner that quote might not be as relevant as it used to be. But um, I hope that answers it. Great. Thanks, Miles. And yes, so I do think it is in, um, as Marler commented, she's on a later version of Blackboard Learn and it is in there. So it is dependent, as Miles said, on your version. And it looks like we have one or two more people still typing. We'll give them another minute if they have a question. Sure. Um, question from Dorothy, what have you found helpful to keep students from leading other students in the wrong direction on the discussion board or what keeps them on track? That's a great question. Um, you know, I would say that it's uh, ongoing instructor facilitation as well. So um, as an instructor, I don't just uh, set students loose on the discussion board and check in, back in at the end of the week. Um, I will give guiding questions or, or um, redirection uh, with replies and so forth as the instructor. And it's, it actually makes grading easier at the end of the week if I am in fact grading the content and discussions uh, because you know, I'm not just evaluating at the end of the week, I'm um, evaluating throughout the week. It, um, I, you know, it's important that you don't leave somebody's question or misconception hanging for too long. So, Having uh, deliberate multiple check-ins if it's a kind of a week-long phase uh, by the instructor is important. And that's something I've appreciated uh, from some of the outstanding instructors I've had in graduate school, um, the ones that check back in frequently and are, are participating and so forth. Question from Lindy, have you ever allowed students to post audio or video for a discussion in replace of writing? And if so, did you have success with that method? Uh, you know, I've not uh, fully explored uh, the voice board, voice thread, voice forum uh, features that are in uh, some of the newer Blackboard LMS options. Uh, I have, though, seen them in operation uh, in foreign language classes that are uh, facilitated online, and I've, uh, I've helped tutor students through uh, that in a blended uh, classroom environment. And they really appreciated it. They really uh, thought it was neat that they could, you know, reply. Uh, using their French tongue or whatnot, and then um, have a discourse uh, in a foreign language. Uh, we thought that was pretty neat. You know, I think absolutely uh, as far as differentiation, if a student needed it and um, there is a valid use for it, um, then it, it could definitely complement or augment the experience well. On the flip side, uh, there's a lot of benefit for students keyboarding and composing, um, especially in, you know, in the adolescent realm. We're always looking for ways to get kids to put thought on paper, and so there might be times where I would hold a line and say, you know, I really want to see your writing and critique your writing and help you with your writing and so forth. Um, thinking of college and career readiness, you know, I, I, I wouldn't let them off the hook all the time, I guess. And one last question in the chat right now: Do the discussion board activities fit with any in class? In, the, in your class activities. So maybe talking just a little bit more about how you structure your different discussion board activities. Yeah, could you, um, I'm sorry, repeat that one again? Sure. Do the discussion board activities fit with any in class activity was the question. Yeah, you know, um, all of the examples I showed uh, actually came from, like, I guess I call it a hybrid environment where I'm the instructor in front of the room and the students are there live with me. Or they were a blended environment. Sometimes my students were traveling due to the nature of the school I worked at. Um, and they might be in face-to-face -face um, at some portion of the year, but in, in a different part of the world at another portion of the year. So uh, I absolutely I would have discussion boards used as a, uh, an example. OK, students, open up your computer. We're going to take time to put our thoughts down um, on paper, I guess, digital paper. 
Uh, and then I'm going to have you close your computer after five minutes of composing, and you're going to turn and talk with a neighbor and share what you um, what you composed. And then we can have a formal discussion, a verbal discussion in the classroom in the face-to-face -face environment. So it can be a great way of if you if you are working in a one-to-one -one where you have uh, frequent access to computers, to just go back and forth between the digital realm and and the live discussion realm. Um, and it adds accountability. Every student has a chance to take time to compose their thoughts and to think critically and deeply. Or students that might be rushed for time have time after school to finish their thoughts and, and compose something well, if that's the way I structure it. Great. Thanks, Miles. That is all the questions in the chat right now if you'd like to move on to your next section. Sure. All right. I'm going to um, move through three examples of blogs. Um, I did quite a few examples in discussion boards. I'm going to keep the pace moving pretty quickly here so that uh, I want to honor your time and uh, get everyone on their way um, you know, within the hour and so forth. Um, but my three examples of blogs start from very basic and concrete and begin to work into more complex uh, activities. Again, trying to build skills with students before uh, I put them into you know, the big athletic competition. My first one, I'm using a course blog simply as a warm-up question. And uh, as the instructor, I created the, the question, which is portrayed there in the green objective and um, black directions. Uh, and then the students use the comment button in the lower right um, and just make a simple reply. Now, I like uh, the blog sometimes as opposed to the discussion board because when students use the comment button, and I display all the comments, it puts them into like a linear list, all visible at the same exact time. I don't need to uh, click through responses and so forth. Uh, I don't need to expand different threads and replies to read everything. Uh, it just puts it there in a, um, in a time and date format, um, and it's easy for me to review. So this is a, a great little warm-up task or maybe an exit ticket type question where I can evaluate and formatively assess my students' understanding of a concept either before a lesson or at the end of a lesson and so forth. In this particular blog, students were able to um, click on, when it says click here in the directions, they click here and it opens up a web page. It's an interactive web page uh, that's, dis that's displayed as a little thumbnail on the bottom left. Um, there's a map of the world and the kids would click on different climate zones. There's about a dozen climate zones that are hidden behind that alpine picture. And they click on the different climate zones looking for similarities and differences um, um, among the climates, and then they reply with some comments here. As an instructor, I'm looking to see how many students identified latitude or the proximity near an ocean or um, the proximity near mountains and so forth in their responses. And then I can make judgments about um, my instructional practices um, going forward and so forth. So, Pretty concrete task here. Just all the students simply need to do is use comment. Moving along in the second example, again I'm using a course blog tool, and this time I'm asking students to create their own entries. Uh, in my objective as a teacher, I want students to conduct a uh, research assignment, and they're going to like they're going to respond by creating a public service announcement as a blog entry in the course blog. Each student's going to uh, research a type of cancer, and this went into our biology course uh, following our, or at, at, actually at the start of our unit on cancer. So we were, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to do is engage my students in uh, finding out about all the many different types of cancer out there and the complexities associated with all these different types before we got deep into what causes cancer and so forth in the actual content of the unit. So there are a couple prompts students were given, and then below I scaffolded it by giving them uh, excellent, great, appropriate websites they could click on and go to, uh, which is uh, helpful for this particular emerging audience. And, and um, you know, these are ninth grade, tenth grade students. Um, but again, students are allowed to go beyond and research uh, websites that they find. Um, they just need to make sure that the evidence is credible and the site is credible and so forth. The neat thing I love about a, a blog is the way that it portrays the student response. <clears throat> um, in a, in a fashion that it uh, allows students to post not just text, but they can put in images and ma like YouTube mashups really easily. Um, they can use embed codes. It's pretty easy to teach a, a student how to use an embed code and take um, you know, multimedia from other sites or 
cartoon animations, whatever they want to create and embed it and so forth um, using embed code. So there's a lot of flexibility with the blog. Um, and again, just aesthetically a different representation than a discussion board. So moving along, uh, this goes into a more complex use of a blog. This is uh, like an individual student portfolio. And so uh, in my LMS, I use the individual blog tool. This student portfolio lasted or endured through the 12-week uh, semester, or the 12-week unit, I'm sorry. And um, at the very beginning of the unit, or the beginning, I call it the expedition, they're taking on a role as a presidential advisor about a heated or controversial topic of global warming and climate change. They had 12 questions that they needed to respond to the President of the United States on. These 12 questions were scattered throughout the 12 weeks of the unit, roughly about one, maybe two questions a week. Each of these questions could be answered as long as the student was participating in the activities, the labs, the research, all the different uh, tasks uh, throughout the week. These questions are open-ended, and the student has choice. There is no right or wrong answer to these questions necessarily, as long as they can back their response using evidence or claims and citations. Um, sometimes the evidence came from our own lab experiences, evidence they collected in the science laboratory. Other times, um, claims and research that they collected from scientists from NASA or the um, scientists in Antarctica and so forth. So here's a couple examples. Uh, well, first, a, a rubric for each of the, the questions. Students were evaluated on evidence. They had to include media. They had content accuracy they had to um, attain, and also use citations where appropriate. <clears throat> Here are some examples of some student blog entries. Um, this student's responding to two questions about light absorption and reflection, which is important with climate science. And uh, this response is from uh, activities that we had in our laboratory setting. The students collected evidence and then they created graphs using a spreadsheet like Microsoft Excel. One little trick or tip that I had students do um, to get their content from something like Microsoft Excel into a digital blog, it's very easy to take the, the content from Excel and paste it into a PowerPoint slide. And then I'd have the students save as from PowerPoint and save it as a JPEG or a picture file. So they would save the PowerPoint slide as a picture file, and then they'd embed the picture file into their blog. So it's really neat that in a very simple manner, they're able to create great infographics uh, from any type of productivity software on the computer. Here's one more example of a uh, piece of student work. This one, this time the students using evidence from the research uh, on different websites and things that um, we were um, we were browsing through uh, during the, the classroom activities. You see a, a heightened level of detail from these. This is a ninth grade, uh, actually an eighth grade, ninth grade physical science class. So um, it's, it's outstanding that you know students are looking at a pretty abstract series of graphs and figures and making meaning from them, and then taking that meaning and sharing it as their individual portfolio. Um, again, addressing the presidential questions. <coughs> So there's three uh, quick examples of using blogs. I mentioned before um, that some of these activities could work for either a discussion board or for a blog. Oftentimes you have a lot of similar features, um, but they just lay out aesthetically different. And uh, I like the presentation manner of the blog for some of these portfolio activities. Let's pause for a minute and take any questions before we move on again. So again, just feel free to write your questions or comments in the chat, and we'll pause here to answer questions about blogs, and then Miles has one final section to cover. And I do agree with you, Lisa, um, some props to Miles about the amazing examples that you're sharing. So I think everyone is very excited about everything being shared on the webinar.
And because we are running um, a little tight on time, Miles, do you want to move ahead to the next session, section and we can bubble up any additional questions that come through from blogs with wikis? Okay, sounds good. So with wikis, I'd like to, um, to cover two examples, um, teacher facilitated content and more open-ended research. So in this first example of a wiki, uh, I'm using a digital jigsaw. Again, a wiki is just a collaborative web page for students, right? And um, I'm going to set it up into groups. I definitely recommend using groups of three or four, maybe five students in a group on, a, on an individual wiki task. Uh, opening up to a whole class probably is going to be less functional, so I'd have multiple groups within the classroom setting. In this particular jigsaw, each student becomes an expert, and this particular uh, activity came from a, a book titled A Cooperative Classroom, a part of a National Science Foundation grant and Antarctica research scientists and so forth. And it was published in the Science Teacher Journal in September 2007. My image here is an example of one of the note cards. There are four note cards, each for a different specialist um, in, in the group. So in this particular note card, uh, the student is an expert biologist. And there's some prompts about information about this uh, organism, a krill that lives in, in the ocean near Antarctica, um, shouldering Antarctica, uh, ice fields, and so forth. And also some data. The students are going to graph the data, and they're going to analyze the information. But in isolation, this biologist isn't really going to get a, a full understanding of what's happening in Antarctica to create some shifts in this population. It takes all of the students coming back as a group, analyzing and sharing their different expertise. There are meteorologists. There are uh, climate scientists and so forth um, in this particular uh, lesson shared uh, by the, the cooperative classroom. The nice thing about that particular, uh, this particular wiki example is that it's very concrete. I'm handing the students a, a card of information. Um, it's predefined and they get used to the wiki tool. So again, building skills with how to use a new tool and not giving them too complex of an activity to start with. Uh, here's a couple of student examples. They had to, in the wiki, they had to um, include their graph. They had to include summary of trends and include media. They could embed a YouTube video or images and so forth. Uh, one student group missed the, um, missed the mark on, on the right here, but not including media. Uh, but you get the idea of um, the advantage of creating these individual wikis. In the um, larger screen capture image, you can see that the Antarctic Research Wiki is broken up of several different groups. There's the meteorologist group, the one in the Krillian group, the ornithologist group. And so it allows students to click between and read what the other groups or the other uh, experts have come up with. And then I also notice that at the very top it says student example um, under uh, as one of the names. Again, I use that uh, example I gave back in the discussion board about logging in as a student example and posting the first um, response so students could have a visual of what this is going to look like. All right, the next wiki task is a little more open-ended. Uh, in this particular one, I'm going to have a team of um, three students. Each is going to be an expert on a different rock type. So this is a, like an eighth grade, ninth grade um, geology assignment. And <clears throat> they're going to research a different uh, rock process or formation process characteristics of a rock type, location of formation, common mining strategies, real world uses for the assigned rock. They need to include written descriptions, graphic images, and links to animations or mashup YouTube videos for each rock type. And they need to include grade level vocabulary. The really neat thing about this particular task is that students can accomplish this in about the same level of time that it used to take students to open up a textbook, read a chapter, and record vocabulary definitions. But in the meantime, I have students researching the web, finding media, finding grade level specific vocabulary to include, uh, you know, hitting a lot of technology and literacy standards, 21st century information standards, and so forth. Um, all in the same amount of time as the old traditional textbook. The kids are synthesizing here. They're creating their own textbook in essence. As a teacher, I can go through and collect uh, information from the different groups' wikis and combine it into one major class wiki that then becomes my text for the unit. And I can base my assessments off of that. Other neat things that I can do with these student created wikis is that I can have students open up last year's wiki and become editors of last year's content after they've done the research. So they could um, take on different roles. 
they look back at last year's uh, creation from last year's students and improve it and delete from it and add to it and so forth. So kids are really taking on real world, real world, excuse me, real world roles. They're seeing how sites like Wikipedia, the most common wiki out there, are created and, and so forth. And it's an engaging task that students really enjoy and appreciate, um, much more than just the old fashioned open up the textbook um, example. <clears throat> um, you know, with open-ended research, I might give students or have in my back pocket uh, good websites to go to if they get stuck um, working with K-12 students. You know, um, I can moderate that as needed. So I can differentiate along the way if students aren't finding good websites or if they're not finding good resources. I'm there to, to help and facilitate um, throughout. I also go back in and make sure that the content they put in the wiki is accurate too before uh, day two or day three where I say, all right, everyone starts studying these wikis. We're going to build assessments from it. Um, I want to make sure that there's no misconceptions in there. So I want to plan for that accordingly in my uh, teacher schedule. All right. So any questions, uh, again, from the audience? This is, that was the last slide, so we're in the home stretch. Great. And just first of all, thank you, Miles, for that awesome presentation. Um, there, was, there was one question before from Gary. Do you find it easier for students to use the blog versus the discussion board? And since you just presented on wikis, why don't we throw wikis into that mix as well? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, they're all just each a little bit different. Um, I would say I would probably reserve, in my personal opinion, I would reserve the wiki uh, until you've at least introduced students to discussion boards or blogs first. As for a discussion board or a blog, they just lay things out aesthetically a little differently. Um, and the discussion board, I think, lends itself to more of these like threads and specific replies to specific students. Versus the blog, um, it's hard necessarily to reply to one student to reply to the next student in, in this kind of a linear progression of thought. Uh, you, can re you can reply with a comment, but the comment is just thrown in in a manner that um, first come, first serve style um, based on the timestamp of the comment. So the comments may be a little out of order um, or not as deliberate in the sequence. And another question specifically about the wiki and from someone's previous experience. And when they used it, um, some students did not participate as much from others. So any tips you have to prevent that type of lack of activity from happening. Uh, sure, you could. Um, you know, I guess that's an age-old uh, issue. You know, the cyber dog ate my homework, or reasons why a student didn't participate, um, regardless if it's an online activity or a blended activity. Um, it it, it kind of goes into scaffolding it, I guess, as the instructor having maybe an, uh, kind of a first draft, second draft format, so that there's levels of accountability to make sure that all students are participating. Um, giving, you know, in that example where I showed the rock type example, one student was going to be the expert on igneous rocks and one student was going to be the expert on sedimentary rocks and so forth. So there's a level of accountability there uh, as far as um, the initial research. Uh, and then they can all work together to do the editing. So, you know, the, uh, the um, Blackboard Wiki tool does provide a little bit of uh, eavesdropping with the accountability, you can see how many edits a student has done and so forth. So you could set some minimum constraints there that you want to see uh, a specific amount of participation with the wiki. Um, and then, you know, like I said, um, just setting up specific tiers or uh, deadlines. Okay, I want this much content generated on the first draft sequence or cycle. And then as the instructor, providing feedback if you see someone who's not uh, participating in an appropriate manner. Uh, so it's just some of that classroom management stuff that needs to be worked out. Great. And then um, a follow-up question about the actual that rock example you used for your wiki about was that easy for you to facilitate into action to have the students comment? Yeah, I, and students really enjoyed it. Again, students that um, are, are sometimes tough to motivate or um, you know they're not really engaged in a, in a typical classroom setting um, really enjoyed that. I think in part because they're digital learners uh, and they appreciate being able to bounce through several different websites at the same time, kind of that parallel thinking process. They're grabbing media, which they love. They're grabbing video and so forth and putting it in. Um, 
you know, I think the probably the hardest part of the wiki is making sure that you that students cover all of the content that you want them to include. And so having a very deliberate rubric and a very deliberate criteria for success, um, making sure that students cover X, Y, and Z within the wiki so that uh, before others are expected to learn from the different contributions that it's all covered there. And, and staging it over days, you know, not just, don't just make it a one-time event, make it a process where if you see something is lacking, you can redirect a student back in uh, to the wiki and add more to it uh, as necessary. Great, and then a follow-up question about the actual assessment process. So how do you work out assessing your students for their activities in these types of wikis and discussion boards and blogs? Is it easy for you? Do you have best practices for grading? I'll go back one slide here. Um, I've included just a holistic rubric in this particular wiki example of 4321. Um, and you know, I could definitely have broken this into a, uh, a matrix style rubric or an analytic rubric uh, with more specific um, components. You know, so including the rubric up front, um, including student exemplars or including um, student, the student example approach where I, I show the target for success is important. Um, also, you know, here is that blog rubric that I used. So I'd use this to grade each of their slides, um, both on evidence, media, content, and citations. And this is for an eighth grade, ninth grade level, so it could definitely become more rigorous for higher levels and so forth. So embedding those rubrics right up front is um, is very important. Um, let me jump back and see if I have some other examples. You know, sometimes I use the the task as uh, uh, more of a formative tool where I don't necessarily have to grade everything, um, and that's okay. You know, there's uh, there's something to be said for why am I using the tool, and if I'm using the tool as like a warm up or exit ticket, I'm just trying to gauge my students' uh, understanding. Um, if I'm doing an open ended response, as long as they're you know one, one of my tasks, my teacher objectives, I wanted them to cite evidence in their in their argumentation. So if they weren't including evidence, then they got a poor grade. But it wasn't about um, how they responded, yes or no, or I agree or disagree. It was about using evidence. And um, that, so there are particular facets that I'm looking at um, and focusing on with, with the students. Uh, and my grading might not be the same with each discussion board. Um, it's, it's dependent on uh, the activity at hand. So one last one, here's that rubric for students. You know, this one's more about discussion and reply, uh, and they would get different point values for the different um, different levels of of their replies and so forth. Um, so I hope that might answer the question. I think it does, and it looks like we have no other questions in the chat. Thank you so much again, Miles, and everyone for attending our Bits webinar today. Um, we are all very appreciative of everyone who's able to share their expertise. And not only Miles, I know a few of you were also sharing best practices and your experience in the chat as well. So we appreciate that as we want this to be a learning and sharing opportunity for everyone involved. Um, I will send out the recording early next week along with a copy of the presentation slides. Um, so look for that email. If anyone attended our, our email this past week, um, we, the, we had an issue with our email going out, so you will receive a copy of last week's presentation as well, hopefully soon. Thank you all. Thank you.